uh, this first song, 435, 435, and uh, since Jesus came into my heart. Aren't you glad he come into your life? Amen. Amen. Uh, a little girl one time said to the preacher, he was preaching on Jesus in your heart. She said, Jesus must be awful little to get in my heart. <laughs> well, uh, that's a good terminology, isn't it? But uh, he'll, he'll get in the heart of anybody who will let, let him in. Amen. All right, 435, let's pray before we sing. Lord Jesus, thank you for the reality of coming into our life and making a great big change. And uh, Lord, and all things become new and uh, how exciting it is to be saved. Lord, I'm thankful down through the years uh, you've grown nearer and dearer to me and you've helped me in so many ways. And we sure need you again tonight. We need you in this service more than anything else, dear God. It's vital that you be here, so God... Uh, we pray that uh, since you are here, we'll yield ourselves to you as best we can, that your will be done in our hearts and our lives. In thy name we pray, amen and amen. Let's all stand and sing 435.
that, you can be seated. Amen. He sure is uh, rocking a weary land. And we do live in a weary land, don't we? And uh, one of these days, all this weariness will be over and we'll be out of here and uh, up in heaven, either by the rapture or death. I'm glad I'm going to heaven. Amen. Just a few announcements to make, and these are things coming up in the weeks ahead, maybe next month also. Next Wednesday, hope you'll be here around, we start at 5.30, you can get here around 6, but we have supper at 5.30, from 5.30 to 6.30, and then uh, oh, in the dining hall, then we have our midweek service out here at 7, so hope you'll be here. It's always a good time of fellowship, the food's always delicious, eh? so I'm looking forward to that. And then on June the 2nd, the first Sunday in June, we'll be voting on the... Uh, 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 the uh, Christian Man of the Year. And so that's just two weeks away. And then on that same Sunday, June the 2nd, we're going to have a baptism service for those who uh, will be here. We've got uh, some folks that need to be baptized, and we'll be contacting them about that. And that's always a blessing to see folks getting saved and getting baptized. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God for that. And then on June the 9th, uh, that'll be the second uh, Sunday in June, uh, we have the Pensacola Christian College group will be here. And uh, they'll be with us singing and sharing their testimony and, and stuff like that. So that's going to be in the morning service. So you don't want to miss that. And then, of course, now over in July, the 8th through the 12th, is youth camp. And this coming Sunday, we're going to have a sign-up list in the foyer. Uh, this is from kids, I think it's in the second grade, all the way up, eight, eight year old, seven, eight year I think it's eight-year-old, all the way up to 17, high school. And don't let the age uh, uh, make a difference. Uh, they'll have uh, events for the junior kids and then the events for the uh, high school ki high teenage kids but I'll be meeting with you and give you some of the details and it's not a, it's not it's a fairly new camp really just getting started so it will not be a big crowd there so we're hoping that we can be a part of that and so it's, it's a one hundred dollars now I'm telling you <coughs> that is a that is a phenomenal price for a week of youth camp and uh, so uh, I hope you your parents will encourage your kids to go and Miss Baker and I will be going along as a part of that trip. And so uh, anyway, I hope you'll be able to go, get your kids to go. They'll enjoy that. All right. And uh, 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 this, this little book was given to me. Miss Bonnie gave me this thing some, some time ago. These are some actual uh, uh, employee performance evaluations. This is how they evaluated some of the employees. And I hope your name's not in here. Okay. I'm just going to give you a few of them, okay. Here's what, here's what was said about one, one employee. Works well when under constant supervision and cornered like a rat in a trap. <laughs> here's another one. He sets low personal standards and then constantly fails to achieve them. How would you like to have that on your resume, on your, on your list? This employee is depriving a village somewhere of an idiot. He doesn't have ulcers, but he he's a carrier. Some of you have worked for people like that, haven't you? Uh, he's been working with glue too much. He br <laughs> she brings a lot of joy when he leaves the when she leaves the room. <laughs> the gates are down, the lights are flashing, but the train is not coming. This person has two brains. One is lost and the other is out looking for it. Isn't this a blessing? <laughs> if you stand close enough to this person, you can hear the ocean. All right, here's two more. Takes him two hours to watch 60 minutes. The wheel is turning, but the hamster is dead. That's bad, isn't it? That's just bad. Oh, well. You, well, sometimes we might be the ones guilty of that, you know, stuff like that. Let's have another good song. Amen. Sing a little bit. Sing a little bit. All right. You can remain seated on this one. Turn to page 389. 389. Once again, we'll sing the first, second, and last. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Yeah. 
Hey, I, uh, with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. We're going to see all the saints. How about that? Aren't you glad you're a saint? Now, we're not very saintly, but God looks at us as saints. Amen. If you, you know, them Catholic folks, they, they got to do a lot. They got to do a miracle, do this and that, and become a saint. Us Baptists, all you got to do is get saved. You become a saint of God. Paul addressed it to the saints at Corinth, to the saints at Galatia, to the saints, to the saints. That's saved people. So let's try to live as saintly as we can, all right? Okay, Kevin's going to come right now, share with us uh, some missionary stuff. We had a, Paul, wasn't that a great service Sunday night? Woo-wee! I'm telling you what's the truth now. That missionary did some preaching, didn't he? He really did some good preaching. I was glad I was able to take him on. And uh, I think he's as excited as we were when we took him on. All right, Kevin, share something with us. <clears throat> All right, I got three letters here I want to share with you. Uh, the first one here is really just a thank you letter from uh, Brother Hummel over the uh, Beacon of Truth during the camp meeting. Uh, we took a love offering up for him on that Tuesday, wasn't it? And that's what the letter is saying. And because of what we did for them, uh, there was a uh, missionary that was able to have a whole truckload of Bibles because of the offering that we took up. And so they were able to ship that them as a gift. And so uh, he sent a letter that he thanks the church so much for the love offering that we took during the camp meeting. Uh, this other one here is the Kirkmans. They are missionaries to the state of Utah. And uh, it's, man, it's a great letter. I wish I could read all of it. But he says, I am glad to report that in the last two months, we were privileged to lead nine people to Christ. And so uh, four of the nine are a family, a mom, a dad, a brother, and a sister. So basically the whole family got saved. They're all baptized, and so that's good. And, uh, of course, they just went on a, uh, a trip to New Mexico in March to the Navajo Reservations, had a great meeting there with the pastor, and they're fixing to host a family conference. And uh, so just pray for them for that. And then, of course, uh, they're adding on to their church uh, where they have social events and stuff. It's too small. And so uh, they're building a 40 by 30 area for that. And it says we are also celebrating our five-year anniversary and so they've been there uh, in the state of Utah for five years. And so that's the Kirkmans, and they're missionaries to the state of Utah. And last but not least, uh, the Lane Jones family, they're missionaries to the Philippines. We've been supporting them for about 30-something years, uh, 35. And it says here that they got a guy coming in uh, to improve their radio. They're going to put in a new 3,000-watt transmitter and improve the radio room for new equipment to get the gospel out. And it says, pray for the, they call it the saturation team. And what they do is they go out, share the gospel, uh, and evangelize to all kinds of different people. Then it's got here, they got uh, from their, from his church, four pastors have been called, and now they have four of the churches. Well, two of them have already got a building started, and two of them they need land to build their church. So pray that God will give them to that. They've got an annual youth camp coming up, so please pray for that. And then, of course, it uh, talks about thanks to United Beth Baptist Church for the $600 for the scriptures. And so um, it says, 34 years ago, we came here and had a handful of believers were here. Praise the Lord for the great things he has done. And so it's 34 years ago that they've been there. So that's the Lane Jones family, and they're missionaries to the Philippines. Hey, man, that's good stuff. 34 years. And we have been supporting them 34 years. And the Kirkmans for five and then the Humbles, the a Beacon of Truth, I think probably 10 or 15 years. That offering on Tuesday night was we need to raise $7,000, and we were able to do that with the different uh, churches helping out. So we sent them 3500 Then we sent uh, uh, Baron uh, Precious Seed 3500 for those five rolls of paper. Isn't that good? I like that kind of stuff. It's a real blessing to my heart. And I was thinking about the uh, Brown family that was here on Sunday night. And they got, a, a, hopefully by this time next year, they hope to be on their way to Turkey. And and uh, and so that's going to be an exciting time for them. I'm glad we can look back, like with the, the Lane Jones family, 34 years ago. And he and his wife and five or six kids went to the Philippines. And and I mean, his uh, the work out there that he's involved in is probably one of the largest uh, uh, Filipino works in the in the Philippine Islands. He's been there so long, and matter of fact, the support we send him, he gives it to some of these nationals, and because his church, the, the mother church there, is where he pastors, and out of that mother church, all these other churches have been. Kevin mentioned four. That's just four of many that God has used this this preacher uh, in in the last thirty four years, and so I'm glad we got in on the ground level. 
Now you said that might, that might not mean a lot to you. I hope it means some to you because you weren't here. When we, you know, I don't think we've seen him but one time since then, except for the newsletter we get from him. Because he don't come home much. You can't leave a church of that size for uh, uh, six months and go back and it'd be the same. So he gets to come back to the states a couple couple of weeks a year or every six months. And uh, but a great preacher. He and his wife and all of his kids are in full time Christian service. And so that's a great work. And. I'm looking forward to the, the Brown family just t- took on in the years to come seeing their work grow in Turkey. So when you give your mission offering, when you give that, that's where it goes. That's a part of it. So I'm glad we can be a part of those ministries. We don't, listen, we, we try to give them what we can, uh, $50 up. Uh, we started that, 50 bucks up. And uh, But our 50, our 100, our whatever we give missionaries, along with another church's little bit, it all adds up. And so it's one big family. And that's what it's all about. So uh, I'd hope that you would uh, continue to increase your giving. Do you realize if 50 people or 75 people was increased their off their mission off just one dollar, we could take on a whole new missionary. Just one dollar. You know that's a coke. <laughs> that's a month. One dollar a month. Just instead of buying that coke or Pepsi, just say, well, I'm gonna put that. I'm gonna increase. I'm gonna use that to increase my offering. And uh, but you know what you'll do. You'll do that, and you still get your Coke. <laughs> That's just a thought there, amen? All right, we're going to sing one more song, a couple of verses, and then we'll have some preaching. Amen. All right, let's stand once again. Turn to page 481, 481, first and last till the storm passes by. Amen? Let's all stand. In the dark of the midnight, have I
Let's get our seats. get our Bibles out. Turn again tonight to the book of Exodus chapter 4. Once again, we'll continue our message on the rod of God. And uh, before we get into the message, oh, Brother David Roper just told me, he said, there's been a lot of break-ins and burglaries over the round old Cottageville area. And so, just want to tell you folks, keep your stuff locked up. Amen. I think last week, Robbie had to come over to my house. I think there was a fella in my backyard or something like that. And Angie thought I was home, but I wasn't. And uh, we had gone had gone off. Miss Baker and I had gone off, and what long our yard was full of cop cars. I missed it all. Sherry missed it all. She we missed all the excitement. But they got the guy anyway. Whatever they're looking for, they found. They got him. It's all seriousness, you know. We, you're not living in the safest of times. Yeah, you know. When I was a boy growing up, you could the only thing that got latched was a screen door. That's to keep you outside. Now go out and play. I'll call you when supper, when dinner's ready, lunch is ready. Now go play. If you want some water, get it out of the spigot out there. <laughs> that's, what, that's the way it was. <laughs> you want something to eat? Graze. <laughs> oh boy. All right. Here in Exodus chapter four, I'm, I'm going to read verses one through five. And Moses answered and said, Behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, God said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground. And it became a serpent. And Moses fled. Moses fled from before it. The Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and called it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And God gives him two more, two more evidences that he was with him. I'm not going to look at that. The leprosy and then the water turned to blood. He said, these things will let them know that, that what you're telling them is of me. But I want to emphasize that matter about the rod and it turning into a serpent. Then if you go over that same, that same chapter, chapter 4, to verse number 14. Now Moses had uh, Moses was sort of arguing with the Lord. Verse 14, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, God said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And, uh, and thou shalt speak unto him. Now notice, what he, notice how God is instructing Moses. Thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. In other words, Moses said, I, don't, I, I stutter, I stammer. He said, well, you got a brother who speaks real well. I'll tell you, you tell him. Okay, God's knocking all, all the excuses out of the way. Verse 16, he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and uh, he, shall be even, he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. Thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. And then if you would, uh, uh, verse 20 and, and 21. And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass and returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to, re when thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all these, those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thy hand, but I will, hearken, I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. And we read that there in chapter 4. And then if you would go over to chapter 7, Chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. I got to get that. Right. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Notice that statement that God said. And the Lord said to Moses, See, 
I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh that he send the children of Israel out of the land. And then verse number five, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. And then verses nine through 12, when Pharaoh shall speak unto you saying, show a miracle for you, thou shalt say unto Aaron, take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went into, unto Pharaoh and they did as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers and now the magicians of Egypt they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. Now notice this. But Aaron's rod, talking about the rod of God, swallowed up their gods. Swallowed up their gods. Then verses 15 through 18, it says, Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning. Lo, he goeth out unto the water that thou shalt stand by the river's brink against, uh, against he, he come, and the rod, and the rod which was turned into a serpent, shalt thou take in thine hand. And uh, verse 17, Thus saith the Lord, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord, when I will smite with the rod that in, the name, that in, in my hand upon the waters which are in the river, and that shalt be turned to blood. I'll stop reading there for time sake. I want to give you a lot, a lot more scripture. Matter of fact, if I read all the scripture I wanted to give you, it'd be a daily Bible reading for about two or three days. But uh, I wish you'd go back and, and continue over in, in, in chapter 10 and chapter 14, chapter 17, and chapter uh, all out through 17, how, how that rod is mentioned, what God does with that rod. Now last week we saw how Moses felt toward what God wanted him to do. And go back to Egypt. And think about this. Last week we found out God, God gave Moses seven, seven promises, seven reasons, seven things that he, was, he would do and to show to Moses that he meant business. And yet Moses still had the idea, I can't do it, I can't do it. Uh, was it that Moses didn't think he could do it? Or was it Moses didn't want to do it? And so considering what Moses knew, Okay, what was happening back in Egypt, he knew what was going on back in Egypt. Moses could have thought more of himself than he did the people back there. You know, a lot of times we get, it, we get, we get in the way of what God wants to do, not realizing that God said, I want you to do this, and if you'll do this, I promise you, I'll help you in and through it. So we see that. I wrote this down. I pray that none of us would ever have the attitude of Moses in the beginning here. His, his attitude was very selfish. His attitude was, was, not, was not what God was looking for. But before we uh, pass judgment on, on Moses, let's understand that once it got going, once, once God began to move and things began to happen, Moses jumped right in there and became a great man of God. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, this is my own personal opinion. Uh, as far as the Old Testament men, the Old Testament uh, uh, people, my hero is Moses. I mean, how would you like to pass a church of two million? Huh? How would you like to? How would you like me be, be leading this crowd? How would you like to be the one who's in charge of all that's going on, everything? And so Moses had a, a great task, and of course, he got such a burden on him one time. And one time, uh, uh, God got aggravated with him. God said, "I'm going to kill them all." And Moses says, "No, you can't do that." Uh, uh, you, you've got to keep your word. And then later on, Moses said, go ahead and kill them all. God said, I can't do that. And so uh, Moses uh, was just as human as you and I are. But uh, anyway, talking about the rod, God already knew. God already knew. He knows any and everything before it happens. God already knew what he was going to do through Moses and through that one object that Moses had, that rod that he and Aaron would use as the instrument of God. And so, uh, uh, in other words, this rod was like a, a shepherd or a herdsman too. You've heard the rod and the staff. 
very common in that day and time. I want to give you three things tonight about this. Hope it'll stick with you. Okay, first of all, notice the appeal. Go back to, go back to chapter four and verse one. Notice the appeal here that God says. He said uh, in verse two, uh, and the Lord said unto him and to Moses, what is that in thine hand? The appeal. Think about that. What is that in thine hand? Now, God didn't ask this question, uh, just to ask a question. God, if you go through the Bible, you see all the questions that God has in the Bible. God already knows the answer to these questions. God knew what he had in his hand. But when God asked Moses, what is in thine hand? Can you imagine the reaction of Moses? What is in thine hand? And so uh, I, I wrote this down, okay? Uh, God's question was to get Moses' attention. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use you. You're gonna be uh, my liberator. I'm gonna use you as my man to deliver God's people. And I'm gonna take away all your excuses. Here's what I'm gonna do. And Moses, you think, what am I? Moses, what do you have in your hand? The thought is this here, you know, we must be willing to allow God access to what we have. You understand that? We must be willing to let God have access to whatever we have. Now Moses had more than just a rod. He had he had he had cattle and herds, had a family. But what do you have in your hand? He didn't say, How many, how many cattle do you have? How many camel do you have? How many sheep do you have? How many oxen? He said, What do you have in your hand? I want access to that. And so uh, he has an appeal for every Christian. You and I are saved and the same appeal he has to Moses, he says to you and I, he says, what do you have in your hand tonight? What do you possess that God can use? It may not be a rod, but what do you have? What do you have? You know, when the apostle Paul got saved on that Damascus road, he said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And God said, oh, you're going to be my preacher. You're going to be my ambassador. And he was that. And so he has an appeal for every child of God. This coming Sunday, I'll deal with how God dealt with me after I got saved and what he appealed to me. Now, bear in mind, God's not going to take everything you got and just throw it away. But God wants to use you. Do you understand that? And if you'll make yourself available, if you'll give him access to everything you have, there's no telling what he can do with your life. But most people don't want to do that. They do not want to do that. And so, uh, just what, listen to this statement. Does what you own, anything you own, open to the need of Christ? If God, if everything you own, what you own, how much you own, is it open? Is the door open if God wanted to use that in his kingdom's work? Is the door open? What do you got in your hand, Moses? What do you got in your hand tonight? Well, preacher, I got a Bible in my hand. The point is this. What do you possess? What do you own? God knew what Moses uh, uh, owned. He owned more than a rod. But God's going to use that rod. You know, sometimes there'll be one thing or maybe two things about a person that God will use in a mighty way if they'll let him. Oh, yeah. One or two things. You see, I believe this with all my heart, that everybody who gets saved has a talent. Has a talent. There's something that, that you have, there's something about you that, that God sees and it may not be big in the world's eyes. It may not be magnificent in the world's eyes, but it's something about you that God says, I want to use this. I want to take this and use it this way. Huh? Sometimes it's a musical talent, singing or playing, something like that. Sometimes it's the ability just to, like Moses, I can't talk. God says, well, okay, Moses, I'll use your brother. Of course, later on we find that Moses got to talking pretty good himself later on. And so sometimes I mentioned about when I first got saved, how I hated, uh, I just was not a public speaker and God's going to use me to call me to preach. I want to use your mouth. 
So anyway, and so to Moses, his staff was not that big. Sometimes what God will ask of you may not seem that big. Well, that seems big or not, whatever you have, whatever you own, God wants to appeal to that and say, what, would, would you let me use that? Would you? Huh? So we see the appeal here. The second thing I want you to notice here is the appraisal in verse 2. His answer was a rod. Just a rod, the appraisal. Now, when he said a rod, can you, now, you, when God asked Moses, what do you have? What's that in that hand? A rod. Just a rod. And I got to thinking about the rod here. It was a common item of that day and time. Most shepherds, most herdsmen, even those who travel had a rod. It was used for all kinds of reasons. So it was a very common item. Nothing, it was nothing beautiful about it. Now, most herdsmen and most shepherds would have a good sturdy rod or staff. In other words, it wouldn't, wouldn't break real easy because they use it for various things. But they were very common and nothing stood out about it. And we understand that. It, it was only valuable to the owner. It's only valuable to Moses, the herdsman, the shepherd. Was it valuable to anybody else? I got a rod. Okay, it's a value. Think about this. Trivial to most people, but not to God. You know, sometimes when, we, when God asks us to do something, when God directs us in a way, we think, well, that's not very big. Not yet. Not yet. So here's Moses. I got a rod. It's not much. It was worth something to Moses, but nobody else. Think about this now. Uh, it was used, listen, this rod was used to govern and guide his flocks and herds. In other words, it was common for Moses to use this, this, uh, this, this uh, rod for his herds and, his, uh, and his, uh, uh, his, his cattle, whatever he had to round up the sheep and the herds. He'd use that to, to rule and govern them and to guide them. Now God's going to use that same rod that Moses used for animal care. God says, with this rod, now Moses, you're going to govern and guide a people through this rod. Think about that. Wow. In other words, now he would use to help guide this nation of people. It was used as a tool of comfort and a tool of combat. Many times uh, 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 he had sheep or goats or certain animals would come and he'd take that rod, he'd sit down, he'd examine them, push the hair back, put the fur back and check for disease or uh, maybe insects and, and, uh, and deal with that. Sometimes he used that to comfort them. Sometimes it was for correction. Sometimes it was for, uh, for protection, this rod. It was, it was vital in the care of his livestock. So it was valuable to Moses but to nobody else. Got a rod here. And God said, I'm going to take that same rod, Moses, that you're familiar with, that you don't think as much. I'm going to use that, Moses, just as you have governed your flocks, you've protected them. Moses, I'm going to take you and that rod. I'm going to do the same thing with these people. With that rod. Wow. So we see that. He be, listen to this. Uh, from, the lowliness, from the lowliness to great power, this rod. Now watch this. They go before Pharaoh. And Aaron takes the rod, throws it down, and it, it turns into a what? Say it. Serpent. Snake. Pharaoh says, no big deal. So Pharaoh gets all of his magicians and uh, astrologers, and they come in, and they throw their rods down, and they turn to snakes too. I ain't got time to cover this. I go to show you the power of the devil. The devil's a powerful force. And God, God allows him certain powers to do certain things. But notice this. So they, uh, uh, Aaron throws down the rod of God. They throw down their rods. And so now you got one, you got the rod of God, which is now serpent. You got all these other serpents there. But the Bible says that the rod of God swallowed up all the rest. Isn't that amazing? There's a truth. I'm going to get to a truth of that in just a few moments. And so they got, they got to see that. 
And so uh, it became a very a major part. It became the most valuable item in their deliverance. The most valuable item. And I'll give you these scripture references, okay? For example, uh, here in chapter 7, it devoured the serpents of Pharaoh. Over in verses 15 through 18, Moses, they took the rod of God, they went over and they took that rod and they smote the waters of Egypt and all the waters of Egypt turned to blood. All the fish began to die. Are you with me? And then in chapter nine, the Bible said he took that rod and raised that rod and it rained fire and hail from the sky as he raised that rod. Then in chapter 10, he raised that rod once again and the locust came. And then in chapter 14, we find that they get to the Red Sea and and God said, stretch forth that rod and Moses stretched forth that rod and the Red Sea opened. They went across safe and and that same safety they got them across when Pharaoh's his chariots came, it closed upon them. That rod, that rod, and then over in chapter 17, uh, verse 5 and 6, we find they get there and they, and they need water. They're dying of thirst. And Mo, God says, Moses, you take that rod and strike that rock. And from that rock came the water they needed through their journey and all through the wilderness. And then later on, over in chapter 17, you find that uh, 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 they're going to have to fight the uh, Amalekites. And, and they're in the valley fighting. And Moses is on the mountaintop. And Moses has got his hands raised with the rod of God in his hands and his his arms got tired. We find that Aaron and Hur uh, had run up the hill and held up the arms of Moses with the rod of God and they defeated the Amalekites. Isn't that amazing? So what God told Moses way back in chapter four is now advanced on. What do you have in your hand? A rod, that's all I need. That's all I need. What a blessing that is. Oh, my soul. And so it became, listen, and uh, once they got settled, once they got uh, uh, across, and even though they were in the wilderness, and they set up the the, uh, uh, tabernacle, and they had the uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant, this rod, they call the rod of Aaron, was put in there, and it, and it, uh, it bloomed. When I saw that, I got to think about that. The Aaron's rod that had bloomed and the Ark of the Covenant, I thought about this. Uh, it budded. It budded. In other words, that's a picture of the resurrection. Amen? That's what, that which is, which is dead is now alive. One of these days, we're going to die, but we're going to live. Amen? Because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the third thing I see here is the admonition that God gave him when he said, notice what God said now. He said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground. Then take it, take it, take it by the tail. Now when God told him to cast it on the ground, he cast it, and when it turned to a serpent, Moses fled from it. He knew what it was. It was a venomous snake. No doubt Moses knew the power and the poison of that snake. And it frightened him. It frightened me too. Now, I don't love snakes. I don't, I want to kill the snakes that, that could kill me. <laughs> but Moses fled from that snake. To add, and to add to that, he, he, he doesn't know what's coming. Now, God said to him, take it, by, take it up by the tail. I mentioned last week that you just don't grab a venomous snake by the tail, Brother Tommy. No, sorry. I got a shotgun, a hoe, I'm gonna kill it. But Moses was told to take it by the tail. The one place that you would never want to pick up a venomous snake is by the tail. It's admonition. I wrote this down faith and obedience over fear. He cast it down, turned into a venomous snake, and he backed up. He's scared of it. He's fearful. I'm not getting near it. And to make it worse, God said, take it by the tail. What? Take it by the tail. You know, sometimes God is going to allow us to be in situations that, that we think is very dangerous. And you and I are very blessed in America. We have not seen what happens around the world. We hear the news. We 
get it in the newspaper, Christians by the thousands are dying and around the world uh, about Muslim countries and uh, other nationalities killing Christians. And so we live in a dangerous world. Uh, I thought about this missionary we took on the other night going to Turkey. And I like what he said. He said, Turkey is the most open Muslim country there is. But now you go to Sri Lanka. They'll, I, I, I'm, I'm surprised we even got any left over there. Sometimes God will take you and, and desire to put you in a dangerous situation. What is God doing here? What is the message here? Take it by, cast it down and take it by the tail. God is trying to teach Moses the value of obedience. The value of obedience. Faith and obedience over fear. Moses, listen, Moses did not have to fear Pharaoh anymore. What God is trying to say to Moses is, Moses, I know, I know your heart. I know you, Moses. He knows the intents. All this complaining, all this griping, all this no, no, no. I want to show you what I'm going to do. And that snake is a picture of Egypt and Pharaoh. Do you understand the serpent was one of the major gods of Egypt? Every pharaoh that lived and died had the serpents part of their statues, a part of their deity. God is saying to Moses, Moses, don't see it yet. What I'm trying to say to you, Moses, when I when that snake take it by the tail, and he took it by the tail, and it became what? It became a rod. Don't fear. Don't you fear Egypt? And when they went before Pharaoh, threw the rod down. The other rods were thrown down. They turned to serpents. The Pharaoh, uh, the rod of God swallowed up the, uh, the serpents of Egypt. That's a picture. Moses, God is saying, Moses, I'm telling you, do not fear Pharaoh and do not fear Egypt. When God tells you to do something, when God gives you a task to do, guess what? Don't fear. That's easy to say, isn't it? But hard to do sometimes. Hard to do sometimes. Boy, especially when it comes to what we consider the little things in life. Oh, I, I, can, I can write a check and I can give some money, but I don't know about this going out on soul winning stuff. I don't know about doing this and doing that. I don't want nobody to cuss me out. Are you afraid? Are you afraid to give somebody a track? You've got two hands. Get a track and say, hey, read this. It'll tell you how you go to heaven when you die. And just walk off. I'm afraid, preacher. Well, why should you be afraid? Jesus said, he said, there in the last few verses of Matthew, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. He said, I want you to tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power. Power to be a witness. So God wants to admonish you to be a witness. And so we understand that. Faith and obedience over fear. Dave, let's think about this. When Moses saw what that saw that, there's no doubt in my mind, when Moses saw that, Moses thought, now. And God had already told him all along, I'm gonna, I, hey, the mighty hand of God is gonna wipe out. He, back before he even got there, he said, Moses, not only am I gonna destroy Egypt, when you leave here, you're gonna leave Egypt and head to the promised land with all the treasures of Egypt. Not only am I gonna wipe them out, you're gonna take everything they own. You know, the devil thought he won the victory when he deceived Eve and she sinned. Because that sin brought the judgment of God. And the devil was happy about that. Huh? He was happy about that. He rejoiced in it. But when God told the, the, the serpent, told the, you're going to own your belly, he told the seed of woman is going to crush your head. The woman, by, you, you, you deceived Eve through, a, through the seed of a woman. A woman's going to give birth to a child. And that child's going to be the redeemer. And his heel's going to crush your head. Aren't you glad that one day at Calvary, Jesus was born of a virgin, amen? Her name was Mary. And from that virgin Mary, the Lord Jesus came, lived a perfect life, never sinned, was impossible to sin. Jesus could not sin, had no sinful nature. He was tempted to sin every way possible, but he did not sin. Went to the cross of Calvary, and then the cross of Calvary, 
the day that, that, that day he laid down his life, you know what he was doing? He was taking and putting the head of that the devil's head under his heel and just rubbing it in. You see, Pharaoh in Egypt thought that they, they looked, Pharaoh was looked upon as a god. And the gods of Egypt were the major gods. They, they worshiped these gods. But, God, but Yahweh, Jehovah, our God, the God of Moses, said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wipe them all out. One of these days, people of God, Satan's going to the lake of fire. We have the victory. It's already ours. It's already ours. All God wants us to do now is say, what's in your hand? Just a rod. Well, I'll take that rod. I'll take whatever you whatever you have, I'll take it and I'll use it. <laughs> you know, David had a sling. <laughs> David was a shepherd. He no doubt David had a rod in a, uh, a rod and a staff. He also had a sling and got some rocks. But you know, when David, when David got there that day to, to take some food to his brothers and check on the battle, when he got there and heard the, the, the threats of Goliath and Goliath cursed the God of Israel, send me somebody to fight. Send me somebody. You're all a bunch of cowards. Your God's no God. I'll kill you. Your God's nothing. David said, what in the world's going on? Who's going to face that uncircumcised Philistine? David said, I will. David said, is there not a cause? And King Saul said, now David, what you need, try on my armor. So David put on all the armor of the king. David said, this won't work. I don't need, I don't need your sword. I don't need your spear. I don't need your shield. Just give me my slingshot and some rocks. I've proved them. What did David have in his hand? Just a sling. And David's, David did not fear Goliath. You know why he didn't fear Goliath? He'd already seen God help him kill a lion and a bear. Look back over your life and see what God's done for you. So David's, David had no fear. I think about Gideon's army. Now Gideon was just a farmer. And God came to Gideon and made him a judge. And he said, now Gideon, he said, I want to, his, his army of thousands will dwindle down to 300. 300! And God said, now here's what we're going to do, Gideon. We're talking about what's in your hand. He said, I want you to get your 300 men. I want you to surround the camp. In this camp are thousands upon thousands. And I want you to get in your hand. I want you to get a, a pitcher, a gourd, put a candle in it, light that candle, and get you a trumpet. <laughs> and what I want you to do is when I, when I give the word, you break those, those uh, 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 gourds, let the, shine your candle, you light, and, and, and blow the ram's horn, blow the trumpet, trumpet, and say, the sword of the Lord in Gideon. So 300 men, all they had was a ram's horn and a, 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 a candle and a sword, and they hollered, the sword of the Lord in Gideon. That's all they had. And when the enemy woke up, they thought they were surrounded, and they began to kill each other. My point is, God doesn't need a lot. All he needs is what's in your hand. All he needs is what you have. Now, what do you have? Moses said, all I got is this rod. I'll take that. All I got is this sling. I'll take that. Oh, boy. How about, how about the little boy with the lunch? We have a lad here who's got... Who's got some loaves and fish? I'll take that. Little boy, can we have, Jesus wants to know if you'll let him ha have your little fish and your loaves. That's my lunch. Would you give it to Jesus? Well, that's all I got. I believe we went home with 12 baskets full. You ever thought about Joseph, the dreamer? Do you have any dreams? What do you have, Joseph? All I got some dreams. And those dreams came true. He knew they'd come true. Thrown in the pit, taken out, sold as a slave, lied upon by Potiphar's wife, sent to jail for years, left there, went to the palace. What do you got in your hand now, Joe? I have not. I used to have a coat of many colors. I was my father, seemed like I was my father's favorite. My brothers hated me, but I had a dream. 
So we see that in Joseph. We could go on and on with illustrations. I mentioned last week about the widow with the two mites. And Jesus used that widow to give the greatest giving example that you could ever have. Her two mites amounted to nothing, absolutely nothing in, in that day's time. Just, just not even a penny. But Jesus said she has given more than anybody because she gave it all. What she have in her hand? Just two coins. Now, here's my question to you, and we're going to give the invitation. Ruth, you can come to the piano. You ready? Does Jesus, now you have to answer this tonight, does the Lord Jesus Christ have access to all of you? Does he? You answer that question. Now, here's here's the next statement. If Jesus has your heart, He will easily have what's in your hand. If Jesus has your heart, he'll easily have what's in your hand. If he doesn't have your heart, he'll have nothing in your hand. For it's from the heart that he judges everything. That's why we're told to love to love God with all our what? Heart, soul, mind, spirit, all our being. So if he has your heart, he'll easily have whatever you have. The Bible says you're bought with a price. You're not your own. You don't belong to yourself anymore. So we're just like Moses. What do you have in your hand, James Baker? What do you have, James Baker? Lord, I have everything you've given me. I found out a long time ago, and sometimes I, sometimes I don't live up to this. I don't want you to think I do, because I don't. Sometimes I, sometimes I give God a bunch of arguments. But I found out that if I had, let him access to everything I have, everything, no matter what it is, it's for my good. And the only way he can, he can have access to everything I have is for him to have my heart. So each day of our lives, you don't get saved again, but each day of our lives, we should get, face each day. And the Lord, this is a new day. I yield myself to you as best I know how. You take me and you use me any way you see fit. This voice belongs to you. These hands belong to you. What have your hands been handling lately? Where have your feet been taking you lately? What have your eyes been looking upon lately? What what has your voice been saying lately? Words of kindness or words of malice? Your hands been handling stuff that shouldn't be handling? Your feet taking you places you shouldn't go? That's, That's not good. God can't do nothing with that. But if you'll day by day, Lord, these hands belong to you. Everything. You see, everything we got anyway come from him. Amen. So it's best to let him have his way with thee. What's in your hand? I tell you what's in your hand, what's in your heart. Well, if your heart's right with God, your hands will do it easily. Amen. Let's bow for prayer. Now, Holy Spirit, thank you for speaking to my heart tonight as I preached. Letting me know, letting me know that I needed tonight's message. Thank you for that. And Lord, if nobody else needed it, thank God I did. But I believe, Lord, there are others here who need it too. Lord, I pray that our hearts will be right with you. I pray, dear God, our hearts will be attuned to you. Once that happens, you'll have no problem having what's in our hands or what's in our lives. All our possessions will be at your disposal. So bless now, Lord, this invitation. Will the folks come to the altar or stay in that pew? Lord, I do ask that they would right now yield their self to you and say, Lord, have your way in my life each and every day. Thy name I pray, amen.